What's up, Barefoot Nation? Today, I'm gonna do a video on aquatic plants. It's a long requested video, and I can't wait to get started. Let's go! All right, guys. So basically, when we're talking about aquatic plants, there's a few main types of water plants. There's gonna be your water lilies and lotus, as we're looking at here. This group of plants is gonna be planted in deep water, or deeper water, uh, basically at about the two foot depth it, to 18 inches is going to be ideal for them. Uh, now you will find them in shallower pools when you buy them from the nursery, but that's not really the, the uh, depth that they want to live at. I actually have three different types of water lilies in this span of plants, and then there's a fourth one over there. Uh, and basically, they are all planted at 19 inches of water to two feet of water and uh, that basically keeps the root system at the temperature range that they are looking for but it gets the leaves more sun. And the main function of water lilies and lotus is to shade the pond. They don't really do a ton as, as much as you'd think rather at, um, as far as removing nutrients from the pond like, uh, like nitrates. Uh, their main function is to take a pond that's in full sun and or, or some amount of sun and to shade and therefore cool the water. Now I don't have a pond that's big enough for lotus to really do its thing. Um, so in the future when I have a recreation pond uh, that, that's you know big enough to swim in, uh, then I will have a bank of lotus, but at this point in time, I just have my water lilies and uh, that pond in the future. Lotus also requires full sun, whereas many water lily cultivars can bloom uh, less, but they can still bloom in, in uh, you know, a certain amount of shade. So, so the other interesting thing about water lilies is that their blooms actually close before sunset. So. Uh, if you want to get your pictures of water lilies at their freshest, um, you know, there's definitely a rule for that, but, uh, you know, I guess that's probably a topic for another day. Alright guys, and so the next category of plants is going to be marginals. And now basically with marginals, there's going to be two types. You're going to have your tropical marginals, and of course tropical marginals is very subjective because someone like me who lives in zone six, a tropical plant is gonna be, in essence, anything that doesn't survive the winter, which is a lot. Um, however, you do get more leeway as far as hardiness is concerned when you're, talk when you're talking about plants in ponds. Now, the plants that you guys are looking at now are elephant ears or colocasia. So, basically, for me, these are considered tropical in most cases, especially in the ground. Um, the mojito elephant ear and this uh, other one here, this bikini teeny, are very much so um, tropical plants. However, given that they are in the water and that water freezes at 32, that gives you a little bit of leeway as far as what you can grow in your pond and how you can kind of push your zone a little bit. So now, why would you want to grow tropical marginals outside their hardiness zone? Well, there's a couple reasons. I mean, the first of it really is that uh, growing tropicals in cooler climates kind of makes you feel like you're on vacation, which is, you know, the, the concept of a tropical style garden is a whole separate, like, I mean, that's not just a video, that's like a series, but... Um, Tropicals tend to be really good at uh, pulling more nutrients out of the water than uh, your, your perennials. Now, and you can also use your pond as kind of a little cutting area that you can root cuttings in. This was just a cutting off of a larger Monstera adansonii, but I can only imagine that if I had planted this in May you know, how much bigger it would have been now given that it's in a very, almost an ideal environment for Monstera adansonii. 
Uh, but this has only been planted in the pond for really a few weeks, and it's already put out, I mean, it's had a leaf that I've picked off, and it's already put out two and working on a third, so it would be pretty impressive if uh, it had the whole season. And of course, the tropical water plants are not limited to elephant ears and monstera. Uh, pothos is another great one. Many of our common annuals that... Uh, that you notice like water will be will just thrive in water um, you know things such as this potato vine of course uh, there is a lot of kind of lighter green foliage in this area but the sweet potato vine is what I'm talking about in this case sweet potato vine is <laughs> a vigorous ground cover in almost any climate I mean even here in zone 6a you know I mean there are some warm zone sixes such as like St. Louis is a warmer zone six, Ohio is a warmer zone six as far as America is concerned. Um, where I'm at in, in western New York is not at all considered a warm zone six and sweet potato vine and all these plants do very well. And of course you could even grow bananas in your pond. Uh, the only thing with this is that you need to make sure that you have the space. Like this is a five-year-old stand of musabastu, and uh, you can see that it is quite wide and shady. <laughs> that it's quite wide down at the base, or as in the rhizomes take up a lot of space. So really, uh, the best area for this would be, especially as far as cold climates are concerned, the best area in your pond for musabastu would or any or any banana really would be in like a wetland filter or in a really nice wide marginal terrace and intake well not even an intake bay in essence they need a ton of space and and root space like never mind the canopy as much but i mean as far as the function of shading a pond or hardy bananas are right there you know so uh, and musabastu is perennial in zone six and warmer so given that let's discuss some perennial aquatic plants for ponds uh, my context is zone six um, but these will work in most zones um, just let me know down in the comments if you have questions about what things are hardy to and then as far as perennial marginals go there's still a lot of options with those um, many of them can fit very nicely into tropical themed gardens, but uh, that's not always the goal for everyone. The one that we're looking at here right in front of the waterfall is called Pickerel Rush. And now this pond is in the shade, so if this were a, so I mean if this very pond were in sun, these Pickerel Rush would start flowering from probably, you know, somewhere in July uh, right through into fall. So, you know, a lot of these water plants are, everyone's looking for that plant that flowers like all season. Many pond plants will do just that and uh, pickerel rush is no exception. Another plant that you might not expect to be a, just in this frame, that you might not expect to be a water plant is ferns. Now not every fern can grow in water but some will be very happy in water such as these sensitive ferns immediately to the left of the waterfall. Now I've got uh, two of them planted on land and this one here planted in the water. So basically what that's going to accomplish in time is it's going to be a big you know mass planting of, of ferns and you're not really going to know. It's already kind of starting to achieve that where you don't know where the water ends and the land begins. And of course ferns are going to do best in a shade pond, although given enough water you'd be surprised how much sun a fern could take. That's the main reason why they crisp up is because in sun is because they don't have enough water. And then to the left of those uh, sensitive ferns right there, well actually before I talk about this, well I'll get to floaters in a, in a while, but uh, right there is a sweet flag, otherwise known as Acorus graminius, and that cultivar there is Ogon. That plant is a super adaptable plant that either will grow in water or out, and it's just a spectacular little water plant. The main benefit to that is that it's evergreen, so if you guys are in zone 5 and warmer, uh, that plant will basically look the same for you all year. 
kind of another area that I was looking to do that uh, tactic over there you saw with the ferns where you don't know where the water ends and the land begins done through plants is with these iris versicolor here now they don't look so hot this year because for whatever reason it's a terrible the spider mites are doing very well this year so it's a terrible year for spider mites um, so you know they've got I mean it's kind of attractive but they've got these red streaks and they've got all sorts of you know uh, essentially bite marks all over their leaves uh, again this is a species that has the potential I've seen rebloom in the water uh, it's nothing it's kind of like a, a reblooming lilac in that they bloom heaviest in spring but they do send up a couple errant flowers uh, later in the season but iris versicolor and iris virginica uh, blue flag iris which is a North American native um, are spectacular options for the water. So if you guys have an aquatic plant such as this arrowhead right here uh, but is maybe too aggressive you might try to plant them in soil in the shade. Now the key to this is going to be making sure that your soil is amended with lots of compost and that they are in fact in shade because that's going to kind of offset the fact that they're not growing in water. These arrowheads here, I planted one bulb a few years back and they, I guess it was over here, and then they've kind of just run towards the sun really. And so although this is a liner pond as you can see, uh, one of a little technique you can do to kind of make your garden around it be a little bit better watered is to wrap your now this is this could be classified as a leak you know so if you guys are filling your pond more often as a result of this just be mindful but it will make that little bit of difference this is the underlayment fabric that i used as a cushion for the pond to you know to prevent sharp edges poking holes in the liner and basically what that's going to do is wick a tiny amount of water constantly into the garden and so the arrowheads essentially you know before I was like yeah there's no external water source but really there is because that underlayment there is providing a tiny amount of extra water to that and you can tell because there's moss that's starting to grow on that and uh, again that's just the liner is just folded into the soil with the ground the soil just backfilled and tamped right up to it so again that's it's you technically should cut that underlayment so that it doesn't wick water into the soil. Uh, you need to make sure that you're not growing xeric plants like yuccas or something on the outside of the liner, but to me that would look kind of funny if there were yuccas growing nearby a pond. And I didn't do that in every area of the pond, so it's not like the whole water feature. So the whole water feature is not wicking moisture, it's really mainly just this one area. Uh, because if you look down here, it's a nice sheer drop because now you see cobbles here, but it's a nice sheer drop because directly under those cobbles, I mean, I guess I'm kind of veering off, but directly under those cobbles is a slate wall. So because slate is obviously very angular, um, in order to protect the liner, I put that underlayment there, hence the wicking action and keeping the garden a little bit better watered. And so here is one of my favorite aquatic plants, just a beautiful, elegant plant uh, in the Marantaceae family, uh, also known as the, sa the same family that Calatheas are in, is uh, Hardy Water Canna, also known as Thalia Diobata, or Hardy Thalia. Uh, there is a red stem variety that is slightly less hardy. I have not experimented with that simply because I don't have the sun to, uh, to keep them happy in this pond. But the hardy thalia is really interesting. You, if you'll notice that little area of uh, discolored stem, basically that's kind of like an, uh, I describe it as an articulating wrist. And what that's gonna do is at night, just like a calathea would, those leaves are gonna go straight up and down. So that's actually in the morning, they, they flatten, and at night they kind of go up like that. So it's really interesting. Hardy Thalia does produce a blossom in sun ponds. Uh, in shade, they will occasionally, I mean, they need to be a few years old to do that in the shade. Um, I think the main 
attraction to growing these in the shade is that they do produce these much larger leaves than they do in sun. Um, so even though you lose the flowers, they're just wonderful as far as texture goes. Uh, the next category of water plants is floaters. And I actually have one of each here. I have a water hyacinth and a water lettuce. So although in tropical areas, water lettuce and water hyacinth are kind of aggressive and potentially invasive, uh, in enclosed ponds, such as an ecosystem style water feature, they actually do a huge service just because they're such nutrient hogs. Um, the only thing to be careful of is if you have them too close to lilies, uh, they're going to take the nutrients away out of the water column from the lilies. So just be mindful of that. And of course the floaters are tropical, so here in zone 6 and, you know, basically anywhere, anywhere north of probably zone 8 where it freezes consistently, these plants are going to die in the winter. And so you're going to need to remove them, and, and I compost them, but uh, you're going to need to remove those out of the pond so that they're not decaying and, and creating sludge. All right, guys, so I've kind of touched on this throughout the video about water plants and how they're good for the ecosystem. But I mean, the, the main reason that you need water plants in your pond, or at least in your system, so water plants really finish out the nitrogen cycle. Now, let me back up. So the nitrogen cycle is, it's kind of the main cycle that happens in water, in, in natural water, as opposed to like a, like a swimming pool. And so basically the nitrogen cycle is what converts harmful ammonia from the fish waste into uh, nitrates, which is usable by aquatic plants. Now, and so basically the nitrogen cycle is what's responsible for keeping water clean and healthy. Now, if you don't have aquatic plants in your pond, you're gonna have algae. And now biofilm is different from algae because I mean, it's technically algae is part of the biofilm. It's a healthy layer of algae. But the, what the biofilm is basically is it's a coating of algae and beneficial bacteria on your rocks that you know kind of quote unquote discolor them. You can see here that this is a nice piece of granite that is in fact green and brown uh, from being in water for you know an extensive period of time. That is healthy. If you power wash your pond, uh, you're actually damaging the filter. Now I suppose you could power wash your filter every few years, your, your you know the biofilm but uh, it's really kind of setting your pond back. And as far as getting the ecosystem established, you only want to clean it when it's excessively built up, the biofilm, or the, the sludge at that point. It's not biofilm when it's thick. So, you know, if you can get away with using the jet setting on your hose rather than, you know, a, a pressure washer, that's going to be a lot better for your ecosystem because you're not, the hose, setting is going to you know wash a lot off and it's going to certainly stir up all the crap in the water but um it's not going to remove all it's not going to make your pond look brand new and you don't want your pond to look brand new because again that's kind of what establishes the ecosystem is this you know kind of slimy coating on stones and i mean on the note of pressure washing if you guys are keeping up on your maintenance with the pond mainly in, in temperate climates mainly in autumn you're not going to need to clean your pond. Uh, if you guys have seen uh, Team Aquascape's page or, or Greg Wistock the Pond Guy, I don't remember, Team, or Aquascape Brian's Pond, uh, this that's an example of a incredible pond that he never washes. I mean, he never drains it. He never does any of that. He just keeps up on the maintenance. In, our, in the case of a temperate climate, in the fall, you're, you're cutting back these water plants. And I guess that's kind of leading into the section on maintenance. So this is perfect to do on a hot day. As far as maintenance goes, uh, with your water plants, during the summer it's kind of this sort of stuff, just kind of picking off um, old dying off water lily leaves. I like to do this during in the middle of the afternoon if I'm uh, available and not working because that's when it's at its hottest during the day. So it's really enjoyable to physically get in the pond. Anyway, guys, 
just going in there and I'm not even using tools. I'm kind of just like, it's kind of a slow, steady pull. And on newer water, oops, see, and it just broke the stem off only. So it might take a few pulls, but, um, you, you know, it's a slow, steady pull. And on the old stems, it's going to, they're going to come out really easily. But, uh, you know, that's kind of how you maintain water lilies. It's not really work. It's kind of just like, and I mean, a leaf like this is kind of borderline as far as if I'd pulled that off yet. I probably wouldn't. Look at that. There's the thumbnail, guys. <laughs> um, as far as that leaf right there, I probably wouldn't pull it off just yet because there's still some chlorophyll in there. And given that, I wouldn't want to um, pull off a leaf that's still doing good for the plant. As far as the marginals go, this is an old elephant ear leaf. Definitely the same story. Uh, I just toss all that into the garden. You know, and it's basically a similar kind of thing with the water plants, the perennial water plants, and the marginals also. You're mainly just the main bit of maintenance here, and I haven't done this yet this whole season, and it's uh, late August. Uh, the main bit of maintenance is just removing dead stuff. It's just, it's literally pruning like you would in the garden. Um, I, something like this, the pickerel tent in the shade tends to kind of flop. Again, it's not dying back, so I wouldn't remove this. You can if you want to. And again, I literally haven't done this all summer. So, you know, there's just not a ton of maintenance surrounding it in a temperate climate. This is literally just scratching the surface of water plants. And so now these taros are pretty small, but they actually have grown a lot, considering that they basically were started from plugs uh, this year. So this is kind of the size that I like to start the water taros in because there's just not that big ball of potting media that goes into the water. As that washes away and kind of gets into the ecosystem of the pond, you're just going to have to backfill with gravel. And you may notice that, is that none of these plants growing in this pond are in soil. They're all essentially growing hydroponically. So what that's going to do is force the plants to use the nutrients from the fish or the animals that you have in your pond. All right, y'all. This is literally just scratching the surface on water plants. I mean, there is so much more to learn. I hope you learned something. I hope that now you guys have a bit of a better understanding of why water plants are important, but also now you kind of know the different categories and you kind of know a little bit more about how to plant your pond. You know, there are endless different ways to incorporate this crucial element into your pond. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, be sure to give it a big ol' thumbs up. If you want to see more content just like this, other different gardening and all sorts of other associated stuff, tropical plants, ponds, you name it, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the bell. And also, I want to hear from you guys, so be sure to drop a comment down below. Tell me what you thought of the video, what kind of plants you guys grow in your pond, or which were your favorites. All right, y'all, I can't wait to see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. There's a bullfrog right there. <laughs> He's getting tame. That's pretty cool. Um, it's Jeremiah. I'm going to name him Jeremiah. And then there's a Jebediah here somewhere. I digress. And here's the best water plant of them all. Ta-da! Weeds! Come on, Blue Jay. You're distracting me.